Well, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us, Franklin Reed, Director of Inclusion and Diversity at Tech Systems. So no pressure, but you are the first male to be on the show. I think I've done 30, 30 interviews thus far. Yikes. I am and so honored. no pressure. <laughs> and you're the first one. So 30 and counting. But no, I'm very excited to have you. I immediately thought of you and what you do as being a great fit for what we're talking about on here. So first, why don't you start off by just telling us a little bit about your role and about Tech Systems, because I'm not sure everybody would be familiar with that company. Sure. Uh, and maybe I'll start with tech and then talk about my role um, because yeah. it might provide a little bit of a, a little bit more context. Um, but Tech Systems, we are a full stack technology and talent services company. Uh, we have uh, over 6,000 customers that we, we really consider ourselves partners in helping them to activate the ideas and solutions that they need in order to not only transform their businesses, but to remain competitive. Um, and so being a partner in, in transformation for us, that means um, being a, a, a value added stakeholder that's not only willing to do our part, but at the end of the day, ultimately um, deliver on the needs and um, the, the goals that our customers have in transforming their business from a technology perspective. I've been at Tech Systems almost 20 years. Wow. Yeah, um, and, awesome. and I've held a, a couple different roles. Today, my assignment, as you, you mentioned when you introduced me, I'm the leader of inclusion and diversity where I'm responsible for ensuring that we utilize the full complement of the diverse workforce that we're building. Uh, we want everyone to be able to fully participate. We want all of those perspectives to have a voice and to be able to contribute. And, you know, of course, that means addressing some of the table stake issues around IND, like representation. Um, but then that also means, you know, looking at some of the systems, some of the um, organizational, as well as some of the marketplace challenges and opportunity will be in an, in an enabler to us uh, leveraging the full complement of our workforce. Okay. And did I say it wrong? Did I say diversity and inclusion? Because you, you said inclusion and diversity. I and did. If I yeah. Uh, yeah. And you've got an opinion about that, if I recall. So <laughs> I do have an opinion yeah. about that. So, yes. Yeah. So, sorry, number one. I didn't mean to. That's okay. That's yeah. okay. Yeah. So, for, for uh, when I took over leadership of our diversity efforts, um, I was very intentional about you know, swapping the inclusion first and the diversity second, because what I found is that a lot of organizations have made some progress on hiring a diverse workforce. But if your organization becomes a revolving door, it doesn't matter how diverse the workforce is if you can't keep them. And it doesn't matter how diverse the workforce is if you don't know how to actually gain access to the diverse ideas, perspective, and experiences that they bring in order to be a better organization. And so while it was a subtle change on paper, it was a massive change in focus. And so we put a tremendous amount of focus on uh, that we built a workforce that people, when they walk in, they can contribute from day one, their voice is heard, um, and that we remove systems that prevent that, um, along with still, of course, focusing on building a diverse workforce. So you mentioned people feeling coming into the organization. So it's not just hiring somebody into the organization, but it's also having them feel included in the organization. And so you mentioned having their voices heard. And that's something that's come up in my research is that, and women, you know, tends to be my specialty is that they don't feel like their voice is heard or, or they're not heard or seen as a leader. And so can you say a little bit more about why that's so important? Yeah. Um, you know, there's Oprah Winfrey has this saying, um, when she has interviewed the tens of thousands of people that she's interviewed, she says it always comes down to this one idea, this one thought, and it is, do you see me? Do you hear me? And in reinforcing and creating an environment at Tech Systems, um, we, I, I realize it's ultimately the same thing. People want to know, it, can their voice be heard? Can they convey their ideas in a way that they are listened to 
and taken seriously, it doesn't mean that you're going to implement their ideas. I think most people recognize that just because I suggest something doesn't mean that all of my suggestions are going to be embraced. But they want to know that you at least consider, you listen to them, um, and they are given an opportunity to continue to do that. And so we've really put a tremendous amount of effort in creating the platforms and the systems that gives us access to our people so that they can share their ideas and their voice and then create a context that empowers them um, in those areas of those situations where we want to give them the thumbs up. We want to empower them to, you know, go forward with some of the ideas that they bring to put to bring, bring forward. And so people feeling like they can be heard is absolutely critical. Yeah. And so you've been there 20 years. You started out as a, was it a recruiter or? I did. Yeah. I, did. I started <laughs> and, out as a recruiter. Awesome. And then you've worked your way up to the role that you have today. And so what has that journey been like? Obviously the organization's great. You've been there a long time. That says a lot, but what has that been like? And what have you seen as far as diverse inclusion and diversity? I got to catch myself. And so as far as inclusion and diversity on while being there. Yeah. Um, so the journey for me, as you said, started out as a technical recruiter, and then I transitioned into a customer facing business development role. And I was in that role for about 12 years. And over the course of my journey, my ninth, almost 20 years, uh, we, you know, like a lot of organizations, um, you know, our inclusion and diversity journey has been just that. It's been a journey where we've taken three steps forward and one step back. Uh, we've moved forward with initiatives that turned out to, you know, to not be the right thing to focus on. Um, it's been a trial and error, error process. But the one thing that we've done is we've remained committed, uh, committed to ensuring that this is not a flavor of the month, yeah. Inclusion diversity is not, um, you know, something that we'll focus on this year and then we'll tuck it away in the drawer and never revisit it. It is a strategic initiative for us. It is a part of uh, how we operate now and it's w worked its way into our DNA to where I genuinely believe that if I were pulled out of my job and I probably should say this or not pulled <laughs> out of my job, but if I, I weren't necessarily the, the director of, of IND, um, but I do believe that there's enough groundswell and there's enough of a commitment across our organization that it would continue. Um, what I bring is, because I'm 100% focused on this space as well as the team that I have, um, we, we've learned how to use it to accelerate as an enabler to what we do, um, as well as to take advantage of opportunities, um, because this is you know, the lens that we look through. 100% of the time because it's our job. Yeah. Well, and studies show that diverse teams actually bring better performance. At the they end do. Of the they do. But what I, what I, the, the one asterisk that I'll add to that is diverse teams that are inclusive bring better performance. Um, because there's also studies out there that, that have shown that just because you bring checkbox diversity, you know, yeah. gender, ethnicity, and things like that yeah. to the table. Um, but you don't create the context where people can contribute. You actually do more harm um, because it's really in the, that discretionary effort. People going above and beyond is where you really start to see organizations innovate. You start to see organizations really solve challenges um, because people feel like when they do show up and they're their authentic self and they can contribute their ideas, they're actually being enacted upon. And so the diverse teams coalesce with an inclusive culture really causes companies to thrive. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's important to say that diversity should not be a checkbox exercise. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And like you said, that does more harm than good. But what are some things that you've seen that work well? Because as you've said, you've kind of done some trial and error and, you know, some things work and some things don't and you've got to be agile. But what does what does work? Yeah, um, I will say organizations that have figured out a way to include their top leaders, not just giving the thumbs up from a distance, but they are engaged, they've rolled up their sleeves, and they are a part of driving the various initiatives and um, the commitment that the organization has shown. In my opinion, it is the number one determinant to whether or not a company will be successful in being inclusive and being diverse is 
how engaged your leadership is. Number two, I think organizations that implement training initiatives that uh, focus on real behavior change. Uh, for example, you know, we've rolled out, like a lot of companies, we talk a lot about unconscious bias, but we've been really, we've been real intentional to not just talk about it in theory, you attend a class, go through a little workshop, and then that's it. Um, yeah. We've spent a tremendous amount of time of making sure that it becomes a part of the new behaviors that we uh, want to display. And we look for ways to interrupt it in the systems and you know, the way we operate uh, because some systems reinforce bias. And so for us, it's been a real conversation, but it's been based in how do we drive new behaviors? And so those two things, having real leadership involved, but then two, connecting your growth and development to real tangible, visible behaviors is absolutely key because, because driving, that's the only way you're really going to drive change. Yeah. Yeah. And how would you address unconscious bias in real time? Is that, have you had that happen yet? Or? Yeah. Yeah. So I will say this. I do think that the, the way, the, the, the best way to address it in real time is to ensure that everyone who's a part of the decision-making process, whatever that is, can use the same language, mm. the same language, it's it's defined the same way because when you see it and you're able to call it out and you see it because you know you're on the outside of the situation and you can call it out it it becomes really successful change when the person who's involved or the person who is unfortunately making a biased decision when you approach them they can also in, um, connect because you're using the same language and, the, and you're defining it the same way um, so I think the organizations that see real change are the ones that have embraced the language. They've embraced, uh, uh, concepts and definitions that when you see it, you can call it out in real time, um, consistently. And that's how you're able to drive change, but then you empower your people. You know, mm -hmm. you, you, you create the context where individuals are willing to be held accountable and they actually invite each other to hold them accountable. And so for me, for my team, you know, I've mentioned to them and I've asked them many times, if you see me making a decision or it feels like um, the decision or the direction I'm going feels biased, then I need you to tell me because that's, that's the unique and, um, you know, that that's the unique issue with unconscious bias is that it's Yeah, unconscious. you don't know you're doing it. Yeah. <laughs> I was just going to say how else, that's why I asked about it. Cause how else would you, cause you don't know you're necessarily doing it and you're not doing it maliciously necessarily. So you need somebody to call you out in real time. It's yeah. And you have real... to remove the, the stigma associated with yeah. unconscious bias. If you do yeah. that, then people will be less on edge and they'll be willing to move freely. Yeah. And when they are called out, it, it's, they're not being called out and being called bad individuals. They're simply being called to be better individuals. Oh, I like that. Yeah, that's an important nuance there. It's funny. I came from a big four consulting firm, and they implemented this leadership program. And part of it was real-time feedback, but then also upward feedback. So you could give it to your supervisor. And the real-time was, it took a little getting used to, to be honest. But to your point, once people start speaking the same language, like, oh, I'd like to give you some real-time feedback or some upward feedback. Mm -hmm. then it became more of a safe environment to have those candid conversations. So I like what you're 100%. saying about that. Yeah. Yeah. It stung a little, stung a little at first, but, <laughs> but like you said, it made me better. So yeah. When it becomes a value in the organization, uh, you actually, what, what starts to happen is people start to open themselves up. Um, and I'm starting to see that now within tech systems where we've got leaders that are making hiring or promotion decisions and they are presenting their process ahead of time to folks like myself or to some of my peers um, and asking, hey, take a look at this process and help me see what I'm not seeing. Yeah. And that's because we've started to turn this corner to where being more conscientious and cognizant of your bias is an actual, it's a value, it's a value of, of great, and a stake, it's actually a value of great leadership. Yeah. And so we can convince people to think about it and look at it from that perspective I think it'll take some of that sting that you talk about that some people definitely feel in the beginning. Yeah. And so actually hiring is one of the biggest areas I'm assuming. And so they have heard 
that you tend to hire people that are like yourself. So what are some inherent things that you've seen in the hiring process within the system that, you know, have an effect on inclusion and diversity? Yeah. So for us, what's, what's, what's funny is well, we didn't realize that the, one of the components that made us a great organization that objectively defined us as a great organization was also an Achilles heel. And that was six, more than 65% of our hires at one point came through referrals. Oh, okay. And that was, you know, many organizations allotted us for the fact that we had a heavy referral based organization. Well, to your point about hiring people that are just like you, um, you know, your net, our networks in many cases, unless we're intentional, our networks and our friend group and the places we go, um, we typically will engage people who are just like us. And so it's inherent that we're going to present and refer people that are just like us. Yeah. And um, while we still have a very refer, uh, a pretty high referral based organization, we're a lot more conscientious about ensuring that we are looking to engage people that may be different from us. So that's one. And then number two, one of the things that we've implemented is um, within our promotional process is we've got a pretty well-defined um, process to ensure that the candidates that we consider come from diverse backgrounds. And so we look for diverse slates um, as uh, we promote people within the organization. Okay. And I think most people think gender and ethnicity, but what else comes to mind as far as diversity? Uh, gender, ethnicity, um, functional. Well, if we're talking, well, if we're talking hiring for us, it's gender, it's ethnicity, it's physical ability, it's geographically where they come from, it's educational background. Now, it's um, we have a, a gentleman on my team that's focused on um, hiring people with that brings also um, neurodiversity. Um, we know that people bring different thinking styles and work styles now. And considering the timing that we're recording this, your ability to engage virtually is becoming extremely important. Yeah. And so all of those factors play into, you know, the diversity elements that one should consider in the hiring process. What is neurodiversity? I feel like I should know what that is. Yeah. But. So what neurodiversity is people um, that may be on the autism spectrum okay. and, and creating roles and creating opportunities where um, you, you look for opportunities where you can engage people that bring different um, elements and capabilities. Okay. I thought that was what it was, but I wanted to just be sure. And so tech systems by nature, you provide tech talent to your customer, your clients. Mm -hmm. And and so what does the tech landscape look like as far as diversity? Uh, well, the tech <laughs> landscape um, is a slow moving, yeah. changing um, landscape. Not to ask you a loaded question, but you know. <laughs> yeah, no, that's okay. We definitely have seen increased diversity over the last you know, two decades for sure that I've been at, at tech systems they're in this space, but it's not happening. I think at the pace that a lot of folks would like to see yeah. it happen. Um, women, for example, women um, are still struggling to make inroads, especially over the last five years, a, a greater representation in technology. And there's a lot of reasons for that. But, you know, for example, women make up 50% of the total workforce they make up 57% of college graduates. They make up 18% of computer science grads, and they only make up 25% of the IT workforce. Now, they are outperforming in the fact that they make up 18% of college grads, but 25% of the total IT workforce. But that 25%, we sort of the industry sort of bounces between 23 to 26%. And we've been there for a number of years. And so uh, we've got a long way to go at not only increasing the representation of women, let alone trying to stratify the representation of women and look at women of color, like, you know, the representation of black women in technology or Asian women in technology or Hispanic women in technology. We've got a long way to go at um, just looking across, um, in encouraging greater diversity across all spectrums. Yeah. And I'm assuming your, your customers would expect some level of diversity. They do. They do. Um, we're a lot more proactive in 
this our strategy for engaging diverse talent and ensuring that the pools that we engage are diverse and then the ponds that we go fishing in is as diverse as possible it, so that we can take a more of a proactive approach to presenting our customers with a diverse workforce and it's paid off for us i mean right now we are either performing at or performing better than the industry of uh standard or the industry the available pools i should say for example i mentioned women make up 20 six percent of the total it workforce where if you look at the total number of consultants that work for us they make up 26 percent of the consultants that work for us so at least we're performing at the available pool for african americans african americans make up about uh, i think it's nine percent of the total it workforce for us they make up 14 percent of our consultants that go to work um hispanics the same um and so we're really proud of the efforts we've made and we're going to continue to make significant investments in organizations and in partnerships to ensure that we're engaging as diverse a pool as possible. Okay. Okay. So you're coming to a company that's never focused on inclusion and diversity, and you're now the chief inclusion and diversity officer. What would you do, Franklin Reed? <laughs> uh, what would I do? Well, the first thing I would do is go on a listening tour. And yes. I'd like to understand. Great advice. Yes. Yeah. I'd like to understand what people are thinking and feeling. That's the first thing I do. The second thing I do is uh, then create platforms so that we can, you know, continue to hear from them. The third thing I would do is, you know, focus a lot on the leadership and building uh, not just a relationship, but really understanding where leaders stand and making sure that there's a connection um, to the criticality of this type of focus. And then, you know, based upon what I hear from the population, that would dictate a lot of the, you know, the direction that I would move forward in. But yeah. it would definitely start with, with listening. Yeah, that, I do that every time I go into a new role. So great advice. <laughs> and then how would you describe, shifting gears a little bit, how would you describe your own leadership philosophy and approach to leadership? Oh, um, so I would describe my philosophy as one, lead by example, embrace humility, try to outwork people, but, but be balanced, um, add value, and remain comfortable with, I'll grow through discomfort. Yeah. So that's my own personal sort of leadership philosophy. But as I think about my team, for my team, um, it's provide clarity on what the expectations are um, and our goals, then provide freedom for them to leverage their strengths to get the job done, and then hold them accountable. Yeah. And so um, as I think about myself, I work for an, a, an incredible leader now who, you know, she's really clear about the expectations that she has, but she also gives me the runway to and the freedom to bring my strengths and my talents and my experiences to accomplish what it is that we need to accomplish. And those strengths are different than, you know, the person who had the job before me or the person who's going to have the job after me. But creating a context for me to leverage my strengths ensures um, that, that I'll be successful. And that's the same philosophy I have with my team. Let me create a context that leverages their strengths to ensure that they can be successful in their job. Yeah. I like that. And so I feel weird even saying this, but say somebody who hasn't been exposed to a diverse environment. I feel like we're lucky in Chicago because it is a very diverse environment, mm -hmm. but say, say they haven't necessarily been exposed to that, but they do want to be supportive and help out and um, advance other, you know, causes and things. I, how do they get involved and how do they become a part of, you know, helping with those efforts? Yeah. So I think you have to create personal experiences. Um, and if you're in a company or you, you haven't necessarily been a part of initiatives that have their foundation in inclusion and diversity, then it means engaging with someone who's different than you. Yeah. That, and, and, you know, that may be age difference. It may be gender difference. It may be sexual orientation or whatever and build a relationship to where you can learn and grow. Um, because it, 
the, making those connections will create a context to hopefully build even allyship in some of the the the, the um, behaviors associated with becoming an ally. And so I think creating those personal experiences for you to get outside of your norm so that your norm becomes expanded is the best thing that an individual can do. Um, so that's within a company in a city. I, like it, I actually, I want to interject. I went to a training program on this topic and we did what was called a narrative swap. Mm -hmm. We were paired up with somebody and you had to listen to them tell their story and they, they listened to your story. And then you got up on stage and told the other person's story. And it was amazing. Yeah. I mean, people were crying for the other. It was amazing. It builds empathy. Empathy it's, is yeah. the unsung hero in creating an inclusive. Yeah. Uh, as a leader, being an inclusive leader, but also building an inclusive work culture. And so anytime you can create a context where empathy is, you kind of force empathy. Um, I think you will, it'll win the day every day. Yeah. Good call. Empathy. Good. Work. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Sorry. I cut you off. So what else? So, so uh, yeah. So, so the other thing, you know, uh, that, that I mentioned with, this is what organizations, what you can do within an organization, but what you can do in your own personal life is attend functions and events that you normally wouldn't attend. You know, yeah. we, we live in neighborhoods for a lot of us, we live in neighborhoods or we live close enough to areas where there is a festival or a recognition or some sort of event that is different than what you might normally engage. There, there's a museum, there's a church, there's a program. And so those opportunities, while, you know, if you're not, if you don't live in the heart of a major city, there's still many opportunities for us to find uh, uh, avenues to connect with people and cultures that are different from us. And then you go in and you be open with, yeah. without judgment. That, it, that will accelerate um, your willingness to embrace difference. This is great advice. Really great advice. So where can people connect with you, Franklin Reed? Are you on Twitter or? I am on Twitter. Uh, Franklin T. Reed is my handle, Franklin okay. T. Reed. And I'm on LinkedIn as well. And so those are two platforms that you'll see me pretty active. I post, um, write blogs, things like that. Well, I appreciate your time and I appreciate you've come out to my classes before and talked and the students loved you. So trying to get you back. So appreciate all of your time and definitely love talking about this subject with you. Oh, absolutely. Me too. I love, 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 love what I do. Love That's what all. I, I can do. feel it. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> and it's well, important. So keep it up. Thank you so much. Thanks.